So my name is Sean, for those who do not know me, and I usually send out via email, just to the members of the church, the lesson, so it's a little bit easier to follow along. And we always encourage everybody to go back and double check for yourself what I am teaching, so you can build your own convictions on the Word of God. So if you have not yet received that, you can kind of just nudge the person to your left or to your right. They'll forward that on to, uh, along to you, and then, yeah, you can just be able to follow along and, and, and get the message as well. Uh, at the beginning of this year, as a small church, we have dedicated this year to be a year to be inspired. Come on, Sean. And uh, so we've been doing some teachings and some lessons about what it means to be inspired. And I know last week, I kind of gave some grim details uh, or a summary about the beginning of 2020 already. All the fires and the viruses and everything going on. And sometimes when we, when we talk about uh, current news, most people can kind of get in this culture of like, the better days are behind us. You know, it's far gone from our experience. You'll have the grandparents and everything, you know, that was only a nickel when I was a child. And, and it just sounds like everyone's always talking about like, the better days are now behind us. Most will say that things are, seem like they're only getting worse. In some regards, it, it can be true. But we also lose sight when we talk about that of all the great things God is doing in this world through men and women he has chosen. Come on. And I thought about, hey, let me look up some good news that's happened in 2019 rather than all the bad things. Give us some good news, girls. In, in last July in Ethiopia, they smashed out the world record for planting trees. Aww. Millions of them planted 353 million trees in 12 hours. Wow. Amazing. New research has shown as well, since the 1990s all the way until 2018, extreme poverty has uh, decreased from 36% all the way to 8.6% in the world. The world and the earth is actually greener than it's ever been since uh, the 2000s, since the beginning of the new millennia. Wow. Um, and that's just kind of due, I don't know if it's good or bad, but more C uh, CO2, more food for trees to eat so they grow more, so that's good or bad, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, but one of the, the biggest stories in, in uh, 2019 19 came from this research of Save the Children's 2019 Global Childhood Report. And it just gave so many encouraging news that's actually probably not highlighted so much every, every day when they say the news. It says since 2000, 4.4 million fewer child's death per year. 40 million fewer stunted children, 130 30 million more children are in school now, wow. 94 million fewer child laborers today, 11 million fewer girls forced into marriage or early ma uh, married early on, 3 million fewer teen births per, death, uh, per year, and 12,000 fewer child homicides per year. And this has been growing in each and every single year, that number is decreasing every year. I think a lot of times we don't really hear of these things, all the good things that God is doing around the world, because there's kind of like a reverse tactic that politicians as well as preachers like to use, which is they like to highlight all the bad things that are going on in this world to kind of scare you into God's arms. Mm -hmm. Or politicians might do the same thing to scare you so that they can write a new policy or, or, or kind of change up the, the government so that they can do what they want to do. And yet when they use these tactics, it kind of sounds right, like, hey man, yeah, we have to run away from the world, we have to go to God's arms, but it's becoming less and less attractive as we see the world getting better. And you might actually, while you're sharing your faith with somebody, you might go, hey, do you want to come and come to church? They'll say, well, no, my life is already okay, I, I don't need that. And they totally miss the point. <coughs> see, you might also see, yeah, the world's getting better, uh, but we also have to remember that the, the world, uh, God's doing a great job in taking care of this place. Yeah. Yeah. See, when you use this tactic, you only limit yourself to finding those who are going through a bad time. Those are the only people that you're going to meet if you're using the tactic to flee away from the world. It's so bad. And that works for a while, but it doesn't work on everybody. You might be able to convince the woman at the well or the man in the cave but you'll never be able to get the young, rich rulers of this world. Yeah. Jesus said that not only are they giving up their bad things, 
but they were looking forward to a life that was going to be so much better than what they're giving up. We were, if you remember, if you know about the young rich ruler in this story, um, there was a man who came up to Jesus and he had a lot of wealth and he actually had some righteous living. Jesus said, hey, there's one thing you lack. Give up everything, sell it all, give it to the poor, and then follow me. And he said his motive was not because he was living a bad life, not because he was sad or his family was, was in an unhealthy relationship. He says, because it's going to get better. You should be willing to give up all those things because God, you can never outgive God. See, this man, when he was unconvinced, he probably went on to do great things, actually. He was still a righteous man. He probably lived out the pleasures of his wealth, only to end up in hell. He had a good life, but it wasn't the purpose of his life. I want us to kind of change the way that we encourage people into God's arms. It's not just scaring them at how bad their life is and highlighting that and make them feel bad about themselves. We should have encouragement to yeah. come to God. Come on, Sean. Not only, yes, you need to run away from your sin, yeah. but you should be inspired to follow yeah. God. Yeah. It's so much better than what you have going on for yourself. Wow. I want us to change how we encourage people to see God. Mm -hmm. Yes, He will rescue you, but He also calls us to have a life to the full. Yeah. In John 10, 10, it says, The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I have come, this is Jesus speaking, that they may have life and have it to the full. Yeah. When you call people to follow Christ, it's not only about what they're leaving behind, but what they are going towards. Yeah. So my lesson is titled this morning, Choose to Inspire. Come on, Sean. Don't just choose to instill fear in people's hearts. <laughs> Point number one is make runners. Make runners. We're going to be looking into a scripture written by our, our old brother Paul here that I believe sums up the Christian life for most of us. It says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 through 27. It says, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last, but we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, do not run like someone running aimlessly. Do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a, bow, a blow to my body to make it a slave so that after I preach to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. You read this. And it almost sounds like a motivational speech is going on right here, right? Yeah. The first time reading this, I'm thinking, Paul's talking to like a rugby team going on, you know? This is like halftime, they're losing. Paul's like, guys, we got to play to win. But then we kind of keep understanding, actually in context, he's talking to a church right here to inspire these guys. And we look at this like, well, is he really? Like, I mean, is boxing Christian? You know, punching somebody? I don't really know. But, but yeah, we, we look into here and he's, He's talking about getting a crown that will last, and that's us getting in heaven. Yeah. And the first thing that Paul says when encouraging these brothers and sisters is something that we all need, need know, but that it bears repeating. All the runners run. That is to say, all the teachers teach. All the fighters fight. All the mothers love. All the fathers nap. <laughs> if you're not napping, you're not a father. I'm sorry. No, I'm sorry. But it's, it's, it's that, right? If the teacher's not teaching, they're not a teacher. If the chef ain't cooking, he ain't a chef. If, if, if the fighter doesn't fight, he's not a fighter. If you're not running, you cannot call yourself a runner. It doesn't matter how many Nike shirts you put on. How many times you go out and get dressed up for the intention to run? You don't run, you're not running. Doesn't matter how many running events you, you come towards. If you do not run, you're not a runner. That is just to say, if we do not follow Christ, we are not a Christian. In 1 John 1, 1.6, it says, Whoever claims to live in him must live as Jesus did. The call to run is quite different than the call to walk along with Jesus or even to flee from our, uh, our, our past sins. When you look at the word flee in the Bible, it's not so as encouraging as the word run. 
Lot was called to flee from Sodom and Gomorrah, and he ended up settling in Zar, which means small. That's in Genesis 19. Fleeing most of the time was a result of unholiness of patriarchs in the Bible. Jacob fled, Moses fled, and even David fled from his son Absalom. You are called to flee to a city of refuge after committing a crime. Fleeing is actually most times in Psalms and Proverbs talking about the enemies of God. Wow. That they are the ones that should be fleeing. Wow. And sorry to say, brothers and sisters, even beauty is fleeting. <laughs> but yes, we understand in other areas, the Bible does talk about fleeing can be a good thing sometimes. The only time fleeing is, is good for us is it says when sin tries to approach and tempt our hearts. We need to flee. We need to run as fast as possible. Yeah. In 1 Corinthians 6.18, it says, Flee from sexual immorality. For all sins a person commits are outside the body, but whoever sins sexually sins against their own body. 2 Timothy 2.22, Flee from the evil desires of youth and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Okay. So the only time you should really be fleeing is when sin tries to approach your life right there. Yeah. Sin is not something that you want to be well-mannered with. Right. Not something you want to shake just because that's, that's good manners and you're trying to be nice. You do not need to mind your manners when it comes to sin. When sin tries to approach your door, you slam it right in their face oh and you God. start exiting out the back window. That's what it talks about when sin tries to get in your life right here. I believe too many righteous men and women, the reason they fall is because they're trying to be nice. Well, I've got to be nice with this person who's coming in here, where I know it's actually not, not healthy for me to interact with this person. Well, can I say no? I don't know if I can say no. Is that, is that, too, is that too mean? Well, this person's smoking or cursing around me. They're like, what, what do I do? It, I believe we fall is because we're just trying to be too nice with sin, instead of just running out of the room. See, so uh, Genesis 4, 7, early on in the scriptures, it talks about how we should be reacting to sin. If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? If you do not do what is right, sin is crouch, crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must roll over it. See, that's fleeing. But running, actually, in the Bible is displayed in such a, a better light, actually. More encouraging. Yeah. Gehazi was called to run towards a woman who was in need. Mm -hmm. Running in Psalms was actually associated mainly with doing God's commands. You run with God. Proverbs 18.10, the, the name of the Lord is a fortified city. The righteous run to it and are safe. Mm -hmm. Mary and the other apostles were running when they heard the news of the risen Christ. We also get running here in Hebrews 12, verse 1 through 3. Therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses, let us throw off everything that hinders and sin that so easily entangles. Yeah. And let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us, yeah. fixing our eyes on Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of faith. For the joy set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such opposition from sinners that you will not grow weary and lose heart. We see here in the, in the scriptures and kind of looking at these two words, we shouldn't be encouraging people to flee. We should be encouraging people to run. Come on, Sean. See, don't inspire people to flee, but to run the race. There is a time for each, but fleeing actually ends when one feels safe and comfortable. Right? Have you ever been running away from something, a dog or a person, when that person or that dog's no longer in sight, you stop running. You're not running anymore because you, you flee, you're done, you're safe now. I think that's why most religious people start short or stop short of godly ambition. They get saved and now they're safe now. I'm saved now, I said the prayer, I did whatever I needed to do, now I'm safe, I, I don't need to run anymore. I don't need to change as quickly anymore. All those things that I, I threw off very quickly before, and now, now they're kind of coming back in. But that's all right. I'm safe. I'm comfortable. They don't need to flee anymore, and the pace that, that they have now is like a walking with God that slows down because now they're comfortable. See, if you're focused on trying to convince people to flee bad things in their life, you won't have somebody actually fix their eyes on the cross. Wow. 
Come on. They're just looking, oh, well, I stopped doing the bad things. I'm a good person now. I feel safe. But instead, when you encourage someone to run a race with a goal in their heart, the running doesn't stop until they cross the finish line. Amen. It's not just running away from a dog anymore. You're trying to get there and win the prize. Yeah. See, we're encouraged to see Jordan get baptized today. But what's awesome about his baptism is that's not the finish line. Yeah. No, that's just the beginning of the race right there. Yeah. Everything up until this point in his life, the Bible studies, the training that God's been doing through his family and, and his upbringing, that was just all training for the run. Mm -hmm. That's all it was. Now that he's entered the kingdom of God, now he's going to start actually running the pace right there. Oh See, baptism is a celebration, but now it's that, it's that almost gun going off. Now it's time to run. Mm -hmm. See, we have, to ch we have to choose to inspire people yeah. to run and finish the race. Not just run for a short period of time because they're running away from bad things in their life. Mm -hmm. Don't encourage people to walk with Christ, but to run the race that's set out before them. See, a lot of people will encourage, or churches will encourage, hey, just walk with Christ, you know, step by step and all these things. Why are you preparing them to walk when they're going to be called to run? Yeah. doesn't actually make sense. Yeah. Come on. Have you ever got into a situation that you were definitely not ready with for? You just got pushed into a situation? To be honest, maybe Jordan's feeling a little bit like this. <laughs> to tell you a little bit of his story, he came out here with uh, his two amazing sisters, and just kind of travel New Zealand and kind of go down to the South Island and travel around a bit. But he came out to a Sunday service here today. And I think I may have cornered him to do a Bible study. I don't remember. This was a couple weeks ago. But uh, we ended up doing Bible studies. And it, it is awesome because this man had just such an amazing pure heart to the scriptures. He was like, if the Bible says it, that's what I need to do. Come on, Jordan. And, and he started changing his life. And it got to this point of what he planned to do and what his life was going to look in the next two months. All of that changed. Yeah. And uh, I felt for him because I was like, man, New Zealand is a beautiful place. I want to go travel around. He's like, no, I, I want to come back and sort out my life with God. Come on. And the Bible studies that we did for him are not like, you might go to another church where they do a, a, a baptism study. And so you come once a week, every, every now and then. No, we went into spiritual training. Yeah. Come on. Okay, hey, are you reading your Bible every day? Let's go out and pray in the morning. Let me go and teach you how to share your faith. There, there was training right there. Why? Because we understand this young man, if he's truly being called by God, he's not going to be called to run. He's going to be called to run. Yeah. And I don't want him pointing at me and saying, Sean, you didn't train me for this. Wow. I, I want to train this man right. I truly believe he's, he's going to do amazing things. Yeah. Why would I not train him for that? Yeah. We, we need to encourage people to not just walk with Christ, but to run with him. Yeah. Why prepare for someone to walk when they're going to be called to run? I believe most people don't finish the race of Christianity. Not because of their lack of heart, but because of their lack of training. Mm -hmm. They get into situations they were never trained for. They were called maybe to believe but they never learned nothing about faith in action. Yeah. Come on, Sean. They were hoped that they would come to church every Sunday, but were not called to put God above everything. Yeah. And so they get into this part where I'm not ready to run this. We gotta encourage people to run. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Call them to run the mark, uh, the race marked out for them. But if we're gonna be doing that with people around us, that means your run, your race needs to look inspiring. Yeah. yeah. If you're going to call people to run, you need to look inspiring. Yeah. You know, over the past couple of weeks, us as a church and Tegan and myself have been training for this half marathon to raise money for the church. Woo. And we're getting to this point where every week in our training, pretty much it's going all the way from one mile to nine miles. Uh, Tegan will tell you the kilometers. Don't know about that. Sorry. <laughs> but uh, each, each week we run one extra mile. And so we're about at the point where we're running four miles now. And tomorrow we're already going to be starting to run five miles. And what I'm feeling, in the beginning, I felt like I was getting tired and everything, but my body's getting used to it. I'm running the miles. But now running four miles, I'm just getting bored. <laughs> like, I'm not even tired anymore. I'm just looking at my walk. Why am I still running? You know? And that's kind of my feeling right now. And I can't wait until, you know, we do the half marathon. I'm like, I better entertain myself. I better get some good singing. I don't know what I need to do to make this exciting. I was like, man, I've been running this race too long. I'm not... Tired anymore. I'm just bored. Wow. 
But if people see you running like that with God, and you're calling them, come on, run, run, and you're not excited about your run, yeah, yeah. come on, Sean, they're not going to want to run. Mm-hmm. Yeah. See, some of us, we forget. Yes, we're called to point out the path, but we're also called to set the pace. Yeah. Yeah. Come on, Sean. It's both. This is a path you're supposed to walk. We show them the Bible, but we, as an example, set the pace in our own lives. When you call people to start running, sometimes you feel like you're pushing them. But we need to get people inspired where they're getting pulled to their goal rather than us pushing them. See, when you're getting pushed from behind, it's kind of hard to resisting. But when you're pulled to the finish line, it's a whole new type of run. That's what we need to inspire people to do. That when you're coming to church today, I'm not just encouraging you run away from your bad life. I hope you guys have good lives. I hope you're genuinely happy where you are now. I just want to encourage you, it can be so much better. Yeah. I want to inspire you to start running the race, not just to flee from your old life, but to run the race and get the prize. Come on, John. Point number two is make runners that run to the maker. Ooh. Oh, you like that over there. Okay. Uh, when you start running, right, you start to realize that you better have a place that you're running towards. Yeah. Or else this is going to get real boring real fast and you're going to get a bit lost here. And see, I'm not like Forrest Gump. By the end of his running, he's like, I wasn't running for no reason. I need a reason right here. <laughs> Have you ever started running, though, just because somebody else was running? I know I've done that a lot in my life, where I see somebody running down the street, and I'm like, I don't know what they're running from, but I'm running away from that <laughs> as well. And sometimes people do that in the church. They get inspired. They're like, well, these guys are running. Okay, cool. Let me just do that. That can last for a little while, but you need to know your why. Yeah. yeah. Why are, do you want to run this race? Right. Not, no, I'm not your reason. Don't just try and, and, and follow my footsteps. Get your reason right here. And he talks about this, Paul, again. 1 Corinthians 9, 26 through 27. We'll repeat it. So, Therefore, I do not run like someone, excuse me, run like someone running aimlessly. I do not fight like a boxer beating the air. No, I strike a blow to my body and make it a slave so that after I've preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. See, this run is a pursuit. There's a chase in your game right here. That you're not just running for the sake of running, doing it for the sake of holiness, but you actually have a goal. He's like, this prize that I want, I'm going to do everything I can in my body to get it and not be disqualified. See, if you want to run the race, you must know where you are going. Some do not run because they get lost at halfway there, and they, they don't know actually where they're going. I believe nothing else has stunted the growth of a, fellow, a follower of Jesus more than, where do I go? Sorry, what am I supposed to do? Nothing has ever stunted growth than that question. And I, I don't understand it. Because if you pick up your Bible, a book full of instructions, and you read something like, make disciples of all nations, how can you ever show up to work and think, I don't have anything to do today? If you have a goal in your heart, there is no such thing as, what do I do? There is no such thing, where do I go? You have a whole book telling you what to do right there. And it's encouraging. And I don't know about you, I read, make disciples of all nations, and I'm like, I ain't getting that done by Tuesday. You know, I'm going to need some years. I'm going to need some time to train for this. My my rest of my life is giving me a purpose right here. See, heaven is our goal. Yes, he talks about that prize that's going to last forever. But heaven is also our business. Meaning we are focused on the business of heaven. Meaning that to win the loss, to build disciples and expand the kingdom. That's our business while we're here on earth. If If our goal was just to go to heaven... Why, 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 don't we, why doesn't God just take us now? Yeah. Why don't we just go to heaven? That sounds like, sounds like paradise. That sounds good to me. Why not go now? Because we're about heaven's business as well. Mm-hmm. See, when you run with a purpose, excuse me, we all must run with a purpose. If you're not doing something with your life, it doesn't matter how long you live. It, it's all pointless. Yeah. See, but when you run with purpose and have a purpose, you, you have a reason to be here. You know, I believe, to be honest, if heaven came not, not too soon from now, or not, not too uh, long from now, I believe my life has been great. I love it. My life is awesome. I'm happy. I have an amazing wife. Um, I wouldn't have any regrets going up to heaven or dying. But 
I wish I could stay here a little bit longer. Kind of like what Paul says, again, Philippians 1, 21 through 26. It says, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. If I am going to go on living in the body, this will mean fruitful labor for me. Yet what shall I choose? I don't know. I'm torn between the two. I desire to de depart and be with Christ, which is better by far. But it is more necessary for me that I remain in the body. Convinced of this, I know that I will remain and I will continue with all of you and your progress, for your progress, and join the faith. So that through my being with you again, your boasting in Christ Jesus will abound on account of me. He's talking about, he's torn between the two. What, what, what? On one hand, I can die and be with God. But on the other hand, I believe I'm here with a purpose and I want to stay. Right. And that's kind of how I feel when you actually have a purpose for your life. It's not about just getting to heaven for myself. I'm excited for that. But also, I have other purposes. I want to see the Atlanta Falcons win one Super Bowl before I die. I have a purpose right there for Atlanta Falcons. I want to see how big my, my kids' heads get. I, when I was a kid, my, I was five and I had the same size head I have now. No, it's, this has never actually grown. It's just been the same size as, as my body has kind of caught up. I want to see these things. But even more than that, I want to see every providence in New Zealand to have a church. Yeah. That we can go out there and plant a church and, and build this everywhere. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to be taken away until then. If God does, amen, he's in control. But that's, what, that's why I'm here. Yeah. I want to hear when, when those false doctrine churches, that they're only actually in history books now. Mm -hmm. That Hinduism is not something, oh, the India says, no, it's, it's only in the history books. I want to be there that day. Mm -hmm. The last time that they're converted. Yeah, I want to see these things. I, I, have a, I have a goal on my heart right here. Come on, John. See, we need to run with the purpose and we need to run to produce. Come on. He says, if I'm going to be here, I'm not going to just have a purpose. I'm going to have fruitful labor yeah. as well. See, he says, we don't want to throw punches that make no impact. But we are aiming instead to make a hit on Satan's hold on each soul. In running a race, there cannot be any lack of production. Yeah. It is essential that we are fruitful with the time that we have here. Yeah. We must call each other from wasted efforts. Some Christians, they're all show, but no contact. And that can be us sometimes. Where we go around and talk about Jesus, but where is the getting deep into people's lives? Where is getting in that, that healing bit, that inspiring bit? That's what we need to do. The thing is that we have to be called here to have a goal and to have production and, and actually meet those goals. Yeah. See, as a church, we have a goal, and I'm going to pretty much say it every single week, our climb to 50. Uh, what it is, is pretty much as a small church, we have dedicated this year that we want to get to 50 members of the church by the end of the year. Why? Because we want a goal. We want a purpose of what we're doing this year, as well as we want to look at ourselves and be like, this year we cannot be unproductive. Mm -hmm. We just can't. Not because of any, anything bad that's going to happen. Don't, don't let remember fleeing be the purpose. Why? We're not running away from God's destruction or anything. We, we just have something we want to run towards. Yeah. We're not trying to flee. We're trying to run towards a goal. Yeah. My last challenge, and in conclusion, I want to encourage everybody, those that yet, maybe you're coming to church today and you haven't yet started that run, I want to encourage you to start running. Come on. Again, I'm not encouraging you to flee from the bad things in your life, but to run with Christ. And the second bit is get a dream. Why are you running? Why do you want to keep the, the high pace? Those who are already part of the church, don't just make walkers, make runners. Give them a dream. Inspire them. Don't just challenge them away from their sin. Inspire them to dream for God. Come on, Sean. And with that, I want to leave you with this scripture. Philippians 14, 16. It says, Do everything without grumbling or arguing, so that you may become blameless and pure, children of God without fault in, in a warped or crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky, as you hold firmly to the word of the Lord uh, of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. Wow. Let's all be runners that run to the maker and have production in our run. Wow. Thank you guys very much.